A year and some change ago, I wrote a script about Treasure Planet, Disney's 2000s sci-fi super flop, and it did okay. But while I was researching The Kingdom That Never Sleeps, particularly their cinematic fumbles throughout the millennia, it was an uncharacteristically grim, mismanaged mesh of fever dreams and fantasies that ended up capturing my affection a great deal more than the film I had originally elected to write about. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of mentioning the cardinal catastrophe in the video, and every day since then, I've been physically accosted by people asking me when I'm going to write about it. Well, in the spirit of Hallow's Eve, I figured, what the hell? So put on your witching caps and strap in. I'm really smart, and this is The Black Cauldron, Disney's Halloween masterpiece. All right, before we talk the Black Cauldron specifically and why it's deserving of a seat in the pantheon of crucial Halloween flicks, we first need to define what a Halloween movie is, which is sort of a problem because we don't really know what a Halloween movie is. There's no widely agreed upon criteria, at least not one I could find. So if I asked you to name me a Halloween movie off the top of your head, whether your response was Hocus Pocus, Her, or Happy Feet, nobody could really call any of them a wrong answer, at least not in a way that's quantified. And therein lies the pitfall of a question with no wrong answer. There can never be a right answer to it either. And when it comes to discerning what features do or don't belong to a grouping of films, this very quickly crosses the threshold from charmingly paradoxical into sincerely annoying. So with no prominent touchstone of tears to go by, in order to classify Coraline or Casper as an official Halloween hit, the only path forward is to start at the beginning and create a new one the very beginning. There's this really big island that kind of looks like a dog standing in the wind, and around 10,500 BC, people started popping up on it. From then until the early 17th century, when it fell under the complete control of King Henry VIII because he was a dick, it oscillated between the total and partial rule of its native people the Gaelic. If you haven't guessed yet, by the way, the dog is Ireland. Anyways, the Gaelic were a fascinating culture with an incredibly long and rich history, stretching across most of Northwestern Europe. But perhaps their most well-known contribution to the modern world is a pagan festival by the name of Samhain, which took place between October 31st and November 1st, marking the beginning of winter and the dark half of the Gaels' calendar year. One of four seasonal festivals and existing as a polar opposite to the festival of Bealtaine, which denoted the beginning of summer, Samhain was a festival of death. It was thought to be a time when the boundary between this world and the other world thinned, allowing the Ishi, spirit-like fairies within Gaelic mythology, to more easily enter and interact with the world of humans. And along with them would travel the spirits of the dead, seeking their old homes and desiring hospitality. Places would often be set at tables or by fires to welcome the dead home, and tributes of food would be left outside along with portions of crops being left unharvested in hopes of pacifying the Ishi in exchange for blessings. And all of this was done to ensure that the Gaelic people could survive the harshness of the coming winter. Most of the still-known myths of Samhain describe werewolves, demons, ghosts, and the sacrifice of other humans in the characterization of the forces of nature during that time of year. Personifications of coldness, chaos, darkness, death, blight, and drought occupy the overwhelming majority of these stories. People gradually began to adorn costumes and masks representing these spirits. And along with bonfires lit as protective barriers against these forces of winter, they had also begun hollowing out turnips to hold candles in, both as a means to ward off the unkind spirits and as lanterns for the young to light their paths as they gathered food for the feasts and carried out mischievous acts and pranks across their villages. Soon, these traditions spread to Britain and Wales, from Britain and Wales to Germany, and from Northwestern Europe to the Roman Catholic Church itself, inspiring Louis the Pious in 835 AD to switch the the holy day of All Hallows' Eve from May 12th to October 31st as well. A little under 1,200 years later, and with a gentle push from marketing, more than 175 million Americans plan to celebrate Halloween this year, spending an estimated $9 billion between costumes, decorations, treats, greeting cards, and, you guessed it, movies thanks almost entirely to the oral traditions passed down by the ancient Gales of Ireland. So. Now that we've done a bit of brushing up on our history, we're able to separate the holiday of Halloween into two hemispheres of representation, the seasonal and the spiritual. 
and from these two hemispheres, we can distill five basic criteria for what makes a Halloween movie a Halloween movie. One, is it made clear that the film takes place in the season of autumn through either setting or dialogue? Two, does it reference the existence of or belief in spirits or the living dead? Three, do the color palettes predominantly contain the colors of autumn and or the onset of winter? Four, does it feature monsters or otherworldly beings such as werewolves, demons, and vampires? Five, does it feature an unsettling or otherwise macabre selection of music in its soundtrack? And voila, if any feature can check at least three of these boxes, it's earned itself a room in the Halls of Hallows Eve. And now that we're crystal, crystal clear on why nobody can say Mean Girls is their favorite Halloween movie just because there's a costume party in it, we can finally talk the big BC and why it gets an A plus from me, starting with the decade and a half that it spent in production hell, or as I've taken a calling it, Disney's Inferno. A lot of big things happened in 1966. David Bowie released his first single, Wilt Chamberlain broke the NBA career scoring record, and India elected a woman, Indira Gandhi, as their fourth prime minister. It was a time of great excitement and great turmoil in a rapidly developing post-World War II humanity. And it was during this time that one of the brightest lights to have ever graced the world of animation quietly flickered out. Before he could see his dream, the city of Epcot, come to fruition, the animation titan Walt Disney passed away from lung cancer at the age of 65. And with the release of Wolfgang Reitherman's The Jungle Book in the October of the following year, Disney Animation's already decade-long doldrum soon slowed to a crawl. The company had become a shadow of its former self, known internationally almost exclusively for its theme parks and live action films. And the frequency by which they released animated features dropped from once every one and a half years to once every three and a half. 1971 brought the passing of Roy Disney, Walt's brother and CEO of Disney Productions. And over the following decade, its animation department saw a majority of the nine old men, Walt's senior counsel and most experienced artists retire, a mass exodus of their brightest animators led by Don Bluth, an industry-wide strike, and a corporate power struggle that ended with the replacement of Disney insider Ron Miller with animation outsider Michael Eisner as their new CEO. An event that would come to be the single greatest impetus for the Black Cauldron's now notorious murder and burial. The Black Cauldron's journey starts around the same time Roy's had ended, in 1971, after Disney decided to option a wildly popular five-volume children's fantasy series based on Welsh mythology. The Cauldron was handed off to artist and writer Mel Shaw to begin rendering pastels of the upcoming feature for use as recruitment tools for soon-to-be CalArts graduates, eager to participate in what they thought at the time would be their generation's Snow White, and the long-awaited reawakening of the once-beloved sleeping giant of animation. Pre-production didn't officially begin until 1973, when Disney finally obtained the rights from its author. But with corporate mismanagement and Don Bluth's departure in 1979 as a protest to it, there hadn't been anyone to stand at the project's helm until 1980, when veteran layout artist Joe Hale assumed command as the film's producer. With nearly a decade of fragmentary progress behind the film already, Hale's first Herculean task in what would later become a famously grueling struggle to craft the film was taking the living and breathing world that an author had built over the course of five books and condensing them into a single coherent film. To accomplish this daunting feat, Hale combined the major plot points of the first two books along with some minor details from the latter three, and picked a minor villain from the first, the Horned King, to crown as the old but new to him film's sole antagonist. It was during this early period of shaping what the film would truly become that Disney veteran and art director Don Griffith, along with a young talent by the name of Mike Hodgson, were quickly pulled onto the project, contributing a great deal to the world and character designs of the finished film, using Mel Shaw's prodigious pastels as a visual guide. In an effort to pool ideas and invigorate the film with a more diverse range of artistic influence, Hale also invited some of the new kids on the block, ones with names like Michael Peraza and T. 
Tim Burton, as well as accomplished artists outside of the Magical Kingdom's domain, such as Mike Plug, the original artist for Marvel's Ghost Rider, to contribute concept art for the film's characters and environments. Despite Hale's best efforts though, the book still proved to be an incredibly difficult body of work to condense and adapt. The film's trio of directors at the time, Art Stevens, Ted Berman, and Rick Rich, began to feel that their sequences had become almost stagnant after months of reworks and seemingly directionless toil. Their lack of inspiration eventually became so perceptible to one another that they even traded each other their sequences, citing no other reason than to have a fresh pair of eyes. And it's hard to blame them for having their inspiration, albeit temporarily sapped from them, when you consider the circumstances of their reworks. See, The Black Cauldron was set to be Disney's second film ever to be formatted for and shot in 70mm, and a few weeks after the layout department had been given new charts to plan and compose the film scenes on, it was discovered by one of the new kids I mentioned earlier, Michael Peraza, that the charts didn't actually line up with the charts from Disney's first 70mm feature, Sleeping Beauty. As they would soon come to find out, the charts that the layout artists had been given weren't actually the right dimensions, and all of the work that had already been done so far on the film would have to be scrapped and redrawn. By this point, fairly understandably, everyone involved in the feature had started to feel that maybe the production was simply cursed, later being cited by Tim Burton as the reason he quit animation. But unbeknownst to any of them, their troubles had, unfortunately, only just begun. As the waves of this first catastrophe began to subside, the animation industry went on strike, pushing back the film's eventual release date even further. And in an almost cosmically cruel twist of irony, nearly as soon as the animators had returned to their posts and resumed their work on The Black Cauldron, the production team would be told that Ron Miller, Walt Disney's son-in-law and chosen successor, had been ousted by non-Disney-affiliated suits from Paramount, ones that most people in the department had never even heard of before. And better still, they would soon come to learn that their new leaders had never touched an animation before, either. Enter Michael Eisner, Frank Wells, and Jeffrey Katzenberg. Not only had these guys not worked on an animation before, but their introduction to the animation studio was a historically bad foot to get off on, demonstrating a shocking lack of even a primitive understanding of the company's work. Eisner famously announcing during his introductory speech how happy he was to be at Disney, followed by, after all, who could ever forget, Heckle and Jekyll and Mighty Mouse, a CBS cartoon. As the suits began to settle in, and as the work that had been completed so far for The Black Cauldron was screened for Katzenberg, he requested to be shown cover shots, and was puzzled to find that having a surplus of material, such as a multitude of shots, only existed in live action productions. And it was after this, when Katzenberg was eventually screened the completed film, that The Black Cauldron was issued its death sentence. As the film came to an end and the closing credits began to roll, Katzenberg expressed his deep displeasure for it and commanded Joe Hale and Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew, to have the film cut by 10 minutes, despite it already being in full color. A ludicrously costly and insulting demand, and one that was not only virtually unheard of in the world of animation, but one that was completely impractical for the film being so close to its release. After cutting as much as they could from the film without causing what they felt would be a irreparable harm to its narrative, Hale and Disney showed Katzenberg the cauldron again, to which Katzenberg's only response was, is that 10 minutes? When Roy and Hale replied with no in a desperate explanation as to why, Katzenberg simply repeated his previous demand, and in a fit of frustration with the feature, rushed into the editing bay himself and cut nearly three minutes from the picture having no experience with either animation or the editing of films, prompting the terrified animators to drag Eisner himself down and order Katzenberg to stop. Eventually, he emerged from the room, but under the knavish condition that Hale and Disney cut 12 minutes from the picture an unthinkable and ruinous act to any animated feature. His obsession with the film's marketability to children, despite its intent for a teenage audience, as well as his contempt for a department that he hadn't yet earned the respect of, causing a figurative cataclysm of the Black Cauldron. 
leaving its pacing, its structure, its animation, its score, and its voiceover work a diminished reflection of what it originally was. One of the most ambitious and grand in scope projects to ever depart from the Magic Kingdom, what was expected to be the next generation's Snow White and the strike of lightning that would finally rouse the tired company from its slumber, forever condemned to failure and obscurity. A victim to its own ambition and the subversive forces of corporate interest that wished to repress it. Anyways, with its production woes now laid before us, it's finally time to dive into the cauldron itself. This part of the video is called Story, and why I don't care what the book says. Black Cauldron is nothing like the story or series of stories that it bears its name to, and I love it. Every beat in the film, from its exposition to its denouement, are completely separate from any one entry in the fantasy pentalogy that it serves as a very loose adaptation of, the Chronicles of Prydain, and the film instead represents a sort of dark fantasy jambalaya, consisting of a myriad of landmarks, plot beats, and themes found throughout the collection of books, and it is a fantastically unconventional and surprisingly harrowing film for doing so. This tremendous deviation from its source material, however, put its already broken form at an overwhelmingly more arduous disadvantage in winning over some of its target audience and critics because The Chronicles of Bredain was still a very popular series of books at the time of the Black Cauldron's release. See, making the decision to adapt a written work to the screen in any capacity is historically one of the most daunting and rewarding tasks that you can undertake as an artist, and it is one that demands a tremendous amount of talent and prose to do so with any kind of success. Many of the greatest films from many of the greatest filmmakers of all time have been adaptations and notoriously difficult films to complete. Uh, the Shining, Seven Samurai, Orson Welles' Othello, and Apocalypse Now being some of the first examples that come to mind. And among the other countless adversities of creating any film of any scope in any setting, it is with adaptation specifically that you must present your works to the unrelenting and unforgiving gaze of the readers, the most critical and least appreciative moviegoing demographic on Earth. Hundreds of tweets, thousands of reblogs, and at least one Facebook group later, Michael Gambon had better hope he never ends up stuck in an elevator with one of the millions of fans who will hold a grudge about this for the rest of their lives. Ugh. Saying the book was better about a film is the cinematic equivalent to saying you prefer your mom's cooking when you're eating at a restaurant. Nobody told you it was bad in the first place, but everybody wishes you had stayed home. It's the same ingredients, it's just the chef's own recipe, and that's what an adaptation is supposed to be, whatever the filmmaker wants. Anyways, point is, every change a producer, director, writer, set designer, editor, actor, or anyone else makes when they're adapting a literary work lowers a figurative sword of Damocles one foot closer to their shoulder, and most of the time, the best route to making a compelling and unique cinematic experience is just letting it stab you right out of the gate, and that's exactly what The Black Cauldron does. The film opens with a fade from black into a dark chamber, a current of ghastly green mist slowly sweeping towards the left of frame to reveal a great black cauldron. The unnerving strings of composer Elman Bernstein and the foreboding reverberated narration by the legendary John Huston work in unison with a low angle shot to establish with a great deal of immediacy that this is going to be the true master of our fear throughout the rest of the film, as the prologue explains precisely what terrors could be wrought from its use. Chekhov's Cauldron, if you will. After a thunderclap of cymbals and the soaring of various horns and strings to underscore the film's title card, we then cut to the signature multiplane camera dollying shot that usually acts as the introduction to Disney's films. And it is with this shot, the roaring orchestra from the title card now replaced with a solitary, gently humming flute accompanied by the bright chirping of birds, that nearly all semblance to Disney's well-established aesthetic and aural trademarks ends. The apprehensive strings are reintroduced with the cut away from our establishing shots, and as we're taken into this quaint cottage, we're introduced to our protagonist, but not before we're introduced to his caretaker. The first line of dialogue in the film, Something's Wrong, delivered in his brooding, elderly voice. Something wrong. 
awakens a cat, and following its lead, the camera departs from the darkened corner we've taken up residence in, panning over to the sun-drenched center of the room, and more importantly, over to Dalbin, just as he says the name of the film's antagonist. The Horned King, that black-hearted devil. After a little more brooding and another slow pan, this time following the cat and Dalbin both, we cut to our first shot of Terran, our boy hero protagonist staring longingly into the sunlight, paying no heed to his darkened surroundings or the cauldron, presumably one that he was left in charge of, that has begun to boil over just a few feet away from him. A candid portrait of youth. Once Dalbin has managed to seize him away from his daydreaming, Terran not only immediately forgets to do what he was asked, instead proposing worriedly that he might not get a chance to fight against the Horned King who Dalbin just ended a very anxious monologue about, but he then burns his hand on the already forgotten cauldron, and is reminded once then and again with Dalbin's particularly foreshadowing response to it of the folly of untried bravery, before being assigned his chores for the day, cueing us into the next scene, one that both introduces us to the prophetic plot device pig Henwen and reiterates Terran's youthful naivety. Discontent with his humdrum life as an assistant pig keeper, Terran quickly submerges himself in another daydream, acting out a courageous stick sword fight, until he's knocked to the ground and quickly found by Dalbin, who, laughing away Terran's hastily pieced together excuse, tells him to give Henwen a bath. And herein lies the Black Cauldron's next significant step away from the classic Disney formula. Our dream-obsessed boytagonist puts his adorable forest friend in a bath as his affable caretaker exits stage left, and if Disney has taught us anything about cinema, it's that this is primetime musical number real estate. But as we boil over in anticipation to hear our young lead bear his soul to the high heavens, he just… talks. And nothing else happens. Not only is there no musical number, there's no music during this moment at all where the John Hudson Elder Scrolls intro monologue and the antagonist's name being the Horned King were just signs, this quiet moment, denying even our basest of instincts that have been developed and nurtured over Disney's past 24 feature releases and 50 years leading up to it, is a giant flashing billboard with pyrotechnics above it periodically spelling out not that kind of movie in Moore's code. And before we're able to even process our circumvented expectations, this happens. Finish scrubbing your hen, what's the matter? Calm down, hen. Stop it, please. What's the matter? Henry. Helen, what's going on? I, I don't know. There's something wrong with Henry. What? Oh, quickly, lad. Bring her inside. The uneasy strings return a third time, and accompanying them is a chorus of terrified squeals. As Dalbin rushes out and beckons Terran back to the cottage, we return to a now blackened interior, and are given the big reveal of Henwen's powers, Terran and Henwen's following hastened departure, bookending the front-loaded exposition sequence for our coming adventure. The only thing we truly know by this point being what to fear, and this is communicated to us through our King's Quest stand-in by Dalbin's reminder that being a courageous protagonist doesn't guarantee you clemency from death, much less a king that commands it. So, the star players so far are Terran and the Horn King, and if we've learned anything about T Grizzly from our first 8 minutes with him, it's that he's almost 100% going to lose Henwen within the next two scenes. Henwen? Before we're able to find out though, the film cuts to another darkly lit low angle shot, this time of a terribly grim and commanding keep, bearing resemblance to the castles of Disney's past only in its extreme sheerness, existing otherwise as a singularly foreboding structure within his lineage, accentuated perfectly by the spine chilling strings and musical saw of Bernstein's composition, suddenly erupting in an uproarious clash of cymbals and horns as we're taken into the Horned King's Keep. The thunderous orchestral piece that had been gaining momentum as we faded into the keep's interior suddenly comes to a screeching halt with the film's next transition, a static shot of lustrous blood red assailed on all sides by shadows. Rather than entering from left or right of frame, the Horn King's blackened silhouette penetrates from below, and the intimacy of this debut relative to the comfortable distance kept by the other character introductions throughout the film instills a tremendous amount of discomfort and fear with considerable haste, 
In this following shot, we are introduced to his achingly cold, almost frostbitten voice as it reverberates through the open hall of corpses that he stands amidst. And it is with this menacing monologue that we are given our last drops of exposition for the film. Its evil power will course through my veins, and I shall make you cauldron born. Precisely as John Huston told us earlier, and as an answer to Dalbin's question from his introduction, the Horned King means to capture the Black Cauldron, and harnessing its awesome power, raise an army of undead warriors to wreak havoc among the living. So, within the first 10 minutes of its runtime, the Black Cauldron has already exhibited a beautiful diversity in artistic influence, and an assuredly refreshing attention to detail, both in its visuals and its soundscapes. Between the comforting and pleasant lines, colors, and sounds of Kerr Dalbin, and the incredibly rigid, dramatic, and sharp line work, accompanied by the especially dramatic lighting and disquieting music of the Horned King's Keep. And it's within this introductory sequence that one detail in particular makes the world of Perdane and the lives that our characters have lived within it feel a great deal more believable. There's barely any food. Uh, I mean, there is some food. It's acknowledged as a necessity a number of times throughout the first few minutes of the film, but between Dalbin's reluctance to eat, the food they do have being an unappetizing slop even to the animals, and Terran only being given a very small slice of bread and an apple as he departs for a perilous, multiple day minimum, might never return journey, as well as the severity of his reaction when the apple is taken from him soon after this, all point to this world being one that is sincerely perilous. The sole instance of food being enjoyed in abundance throughout the entire film, in fact, taking place within the Horn King's own banquet hall. Uh, sure, there's a bushel of apples sat outside of Dalbin and Terran's cottage for a grand total of one shot, but their being laid outside, away from the food the characters are interacting with, is an important distinction as well. They aren't indulging in their excess because the food, more than likely, is not for them. Rations and crop taxes, especially in times of great war like the one taking place off screen, exist to these characters. Though the good and their lack of indulgence juxtapose against the evil in their gluttony may be a relatively minute detail paling in comparison to the many wondrous set pieces and action sequences throughout most of the film, it is this eccentricity that I would argue aids the Black Cauldron in separating itself from its familial bonds and presenting a living, breathing world the most. Uh, speaking of detailed environments and the Horn King's keep, I think now would be a good time to talk animation, special effects, and editing. Alright, so remember earlier when we talked about the whole 12 minutes of completed footage being cut from the film thing? Right, so it turns out doing something like that leaves some pretty gaping holes in your film's story. Not just narratively, but visually as well. Many of the shots cut from the originally completed Black Cauldron were transition shots, or shots which contained too much violence to stay at the PG rating that Cats and the Gang were gunning for. The problem with this, or at least the greatest of many problems with it, is that without some of these sequences being reanimated, the Black Cauldron would have released as a mostly incoherent sequence of disconnected moments. So the last year of the film's production saw the reanimation of some of these shots, but with brevity being vastly favored over quality. And the result was a film that was mostly coherent, at least from a narrative perspective, but one that featured a myriad of visual inconsistencies. Uh, here, actually, this is one of my favorite examples. This is the introduction of Gurgi, when Terran in his search for Henwen is assailed from above and then robbed of his apple by the Forbidden Forest's favorite dog child. Keep an eye on Gurgi's color and his line art. Look what I've got. Come on out. Here's a lovely yeah! Oh, Ooh, Greek prince. Give poor starving Gurgi munchings and crunchies. Got it? All right, we'll pin that up right here. Now let's watch Gurgi's second appearance, only three minutes later. Not going there. Forget the piggy. What are you doing here? Gurgi come back to be your friend. Friend? You're no friend. Why, you ran away when I... Notice anything? 
Gurgi's fur from this point until the end of the film is noticeably desaturated in comparison to his introduction, regardless of lighting. And with this reemergence to warn Terran of the dangers awaiting him in the Horned King's Keep, his outline changes as well. From this olive blue we originally saw to a solid black, like the rest of the cast, for the rest of the film. Oh, here's another example. One of the most eviscerated sequences in the entire film is the Cauldronborn sequence near its conclusion, which in its original state had infamously caused Disney's test screening to be stormed out of by almost every child and parent in the audience. Watch this. Half eyes, no eyes, then full eyes. An ocean lies between the first two shots and the latter third shot in terms of quality. But what makes this inconsistency so compelling is how and why this was changed to begin with. So first of all, these two shots are not a character appearance and then a following cut on action of that same character. The first skeleton is wearing an iron helmet and has faintly glowing pupils that a few of the cauldron born are pictured with. After the cut, a second skeleton emerges with a cracked skull wearing leather armor with no helmet. This is because this sequence where the cauldron born emerge and quickly kill and then resurrect the Horned King's living soldiers as more cauldron born is supposed to have lasted way, 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 way longer. The first two are cut together to give the impression this is one skeleton, lunging forward and allowing the skeletons in the third shot to follow through on this movement. The scene is pieced together this way and its third shot was hurriedly redrawn because every sequence that takes place within the Horn King's Keep throughout the film featured remarkably violent moments. During Terran's original escape from the castle, he actually kills a number of soldiers with his magic sword, and in the original version of this cauldron born awakening sequence, a skeleton slices a soldier's throat open, and this trio of cauldron born are not only pictured leaping onto the terrified men, but the film cuts to a shot of the two men's skin boiling, melting, and decomposing as they scream, leaving only their bones to bolster the forces of the cauldron born. The film was actually so graphic and so consistently committed to its macabre aesthetic in its original form that if it had remained untouched and had Joe Hale been able to release the film his team had struggled so much to create, The Black Cauldron would have made history as the first Disney animated feature to receive an R rating. More than cutting violence though, Katzenberg forced Hale and Disney to cut out entire interactions. When Terran is first imprisoned within the keep, lines that he had said to Dalbin echo in his mind before he picks up a conspicuously light rock and clacks it against a stone wall behind him. You must make sure he never uses anyone to find the black cauldron. I won't fail you, Dalbin. Look at me, Hen. I can do it. Do it. I can do it. The only problem is, Taryn never said some of those lines in the final cut we were given. Another example is here, when Fluter and Alanwi meet Gurgi for the first time. Too big anyway. Oh. Oh. <laughs> You're charming. And too. Notice how he completely changes the direction he was facing, and how Alanwi lets out two differently pitched sighs, one right after another? Oh. Oh. There's an entire sentence that was cut out of this interaction, leaving only a disjointed series of sighs and Gurgi snapping over a hundred degrees. In fact, this sequence, in which the trio following their escape fall into an argument and temporarily split from one another, was originally much longer as well. That's why the scene begins as Fluter is reaching the end of a song he's written, and why Alanwi seems to giggle in bizarrely quick succession throughout this conversation. Perhaps the most grievous of these cuts, though, is the removal of the Fellowship's reaction when the cauldron erupts from the ground in Morva, before the trio of witches mock them for their inability to destroy it. Black cauldron. It's ours. The companions battered the cauldron with all their might. Taran struck it with a huge stick. Quick! We must destroy it! The witches peered down from among the clouds. 
This is exactly the kind of scene that Hale and Disney tried in vain to save in their first cut. It perfectly captures the unshackled, youthful vigor that our unlikely fellowship is bound together with, and is a reaction that is both gratifying and expected given the immeasurable terrors we know the Black Cauldron can unleash. Denying its viewers another glimpse of unrestrained and foolhardy and desperate action saps the sequence of its tension and momentum, leaving a hole more noticeable to its audience than any minute jump in the score or short desync with the ADR ever could, even though this exclusion left neither in its wake. And that's the true pity about the Black Cauldron. Even with so much of it cut and re-sewn together, pieces of its second act being ripped from its foundations and placed in the first act to be used as a character introduction, awkwardly floaty movements feeling as if they were slowed down to fill the length of a shot, and unnecessarily rigid ones feeling like they were sped up to shave runtime, the film still manages to retain nearly all of its spirit, and is to me a wonderful and enchanting watch. But the few instances where it truly suffers from these cuts are instances that didn't actually need to be taken out, and are ones that we know wouldn't have been had Katzenberg just left Disney and Hale to finish their film, or at least relented after they cut their first six minutes. There is no issue of pacing or strong display of violence that could bump up its rating to PG-13 and make it harder to market to kids by including this, and it's at most an additional 20 seconds of runtime. But what is lost is one of the most candid expressions of who our characters are and who they are written for in the film. But despite its inconsistencies, The Black Cauldron truly was the Snow White of its time. The animation on display throughout a majority of its runtime is some of the most fluid and convincing movement I've ever seen copied to a cell, and the intensity of its special effects, as well as its use of early CG, amplify an already electrifying and at times nightmarish film to create one of the most visually arresting experiences that Disney has ever given us. The fervency of Henwin's desperate sprint that we're given a bird's eye view of, and the ferocity and strength captured in the dragon's impact with both the ground and her are even more agonizing and imposing than the screams she lets out in response to it. The decrepitness and the terrible strength still lying beneath the horned king's hands as he effortlessly shatters a chalice or crushes Creeper's windpipe, as well as his slow but deliberate footsteps instill a greater, much deeper fear in the hearts of the Black Cauldron's audience than any other Disney villain from any Disney era. It is a film so convincing in its depiction of the slow decay and terrible strength of death and of life's thunderous and unrelenting charge against it that even in its eviscerated form it remains Disney's scariest animated feature, as well as one of its most technologically progressive. Having realized a potential for computer imagery fairly soon after its introduction to film, Don Griffith and Joe Hale pulled a CG team from The Great Mouse Detective, and with their help, brought to life the whimsical, iridescent bauble of Alanwis, as well as the Black Cauldron itself and the terrible flames that it belches forth during the climactic conclusion of the film. The Black Cauldron's special effects team brought such blinding and intense and chilling images to the screen that its visuals were without equal in animated features until long after the film was released. Every glowing strike of lightning from Terran's sword, every dancing cauldron in the witch's hovel, every fair folk's delicate flight, and every sibylline sequence of Henwin's watery visions sets an incredibly high benchmark that even contemporary animated films feel like they either struggle to reach or don't try to reach at all. It feels as excited and eager to lean into the future as it does boldly defiant of the arbitrary standards and expectations projected upon it by the family it belongs to. It is, to me, 45 years after its production began and 33 years after its release, still Disney's most sincerely and singularly youthful film. Which brings me to characterization. The Black Cauldron came out during a time when the theatrical and retail markets for adolescents was at an all-time high thanks to a little-known remake of The Hidden Fortress. And needless to say, a lot of board members at the House of Mouse wanted in. We may have been given a cottage window instead of a binary sunset, but no matter how you cut it, Terran is the closest Disney ever came to owning their own Luke Skywalker until they owned 
Luke Skywalker. And this is where, narratively, the Black Cauldron doesn't just shine, but is paradoxically helped by its relationships and personalities being underdeveloped as a result of Katzenberg's forced cuts. Uh, hear me out. In the original Black Cauldron, there's a moment when Terran and Alanwi nearly kiss on accident, before their almost kiss near the end. And it is just after a longer version of their argument following their escape from the Horned King's Keep. In the original cut of the film, obviously, there is a clearer and more reasonable catalyst for their disagreement to build into an argument, and the discourse itself lasts slightly longer before provoking Alanwi and Terran's very strong emotional reactions. However, in The Black Cauldron we were given, this entire argument from beginning to escalation to eruption to end takes something like 50 seconds. Alanwi questions if Terran really wasn't scared of the thing he was obviously scared of, Terran says she's just a girl so what does she know, and Alanwi understandably wants to hit him in the face for it. The original version of this argument sounds like a believable interaction between adults, and that's kind of the problem, or would be a problem if this was the version of them and their relationship we were given. Because Taryn is only 14, and Alanwi is only 12. Their relationship as friends, let alone love interests, being one that is immature and awkward and one that seemingly makes very little progress by the end of the film, is believable. It feels genuine. I am overwhelmingly more inclined to trust that adolescents would very quickly erupt into a fight and then just as quickly resolve it, or spend very little time trying to foster a romantic relationship despite their obviously mutual affection, because they are kids. More than just believable, it's consistent. The four protagonists of the film, Taran, Alanwi, Fluter, and Gurgi, are each introduced to us as a distinctly childish and innocent person in an otherwise fairly serious and perilous world. Taran daydreams of being a great warrior, spending most of the first ten minutes of the film pining for the day he becomes the greatest hero in all of Perdain. When Alanwi finds Terran in his cell, she immediately asks in a very playful tone whether he's a lord or a warrior, as if they're playing a game, and it's never made clear either by her own elaboration or by her behavior whether she's actually a princess, or just pretending to be. When we're introduced to Fluter soon after, it's immediately made clear to us that he is playing pretend, his magical harp breaking one of its strings with each of Fluter's lies about his renown and talent as a bard. The few occasions throughout the film that do necessitate him to act like an adult being ones that he initially fumbles and stutters in response to, and when he finally does find his footing, the delivery of his lines along with his body language feel very much like a child that has worked up the courage to say what they think an adult would say. The one time in the film he successfully taps into and stays in his adulthood being when he quotes the only other adult characters he's met in the film as a rebuke to them. And finally, Gurgi, who spends the entirety of the film mishandling his excitement and affection for a new friend, misinterpreting and internalizing Terran's brief flashes of anger, and misunderstanding the worth of his possessions beyond his own limited scope, even trying to exchange an apple core for an ancient, all-powerful weapon of death. Neither Gurgi or Fluter or Alanwi or Terran truly occupy a previously established trope within the Disney canon, and instead exist as youths in revolt against not just the Horn King's tyrannical grasp over Perdain, but against the generational expectations placed upon their young shoulders as well. The Black Cauldron's characters, and the underdevelopment of them and their relationships, are as defiant to the ideas of legacy and expectation as youth is to antiquity, or as a fire is to the cold. And now for my favorite part, where I come back to the start and tell you why The Black Cauldron isn't just a Halloween movie, but why it's the best Halloween movie I've ever seen. And these are a few of the things that I've just got to, I've got to get through to you. Oh, Halloween is a festival of death, contrived as a bulwark against the creeping march of winter and the forces of decay that it brings. But to stay winter's tireless stride, the Gales knew what a lot of people, especially many of the executives and critics of the 1980s that the Black Cauldron premiered to, seemed to have forgotten. The only way to truly triumph against the unrelenting tides of decrepitude is to invoke their most resolute and uncompromising adversary. Youth. 
Their immense bonfires and flame-adorned hearths, as well as the candles carried by the young to light their paths, were thought of as wards and harbors of protection against the encroaching, frigid waves of winter, paragons of the sun's powers and the properties of them, warmth, brilliance, and growth. And in this respect, I struggle to think of a greater exemplar of what Halloween truly represents than the Black Cauldron. Just as the Gales knew that the only means of defense against atrophy and the hastened approach of death was not just to pay reverence to their past, but to meet the advancing forces of ruin head on with a clamorous cavalry of warmth and youth, so too did Joe Hale and the countless budding, bright-eyed artists that he stood at the helm of. Every pencil stroke, every paintbrush, every word, and every note of the Black Cauldron in its original form, and even more so in the maimed echo of it that we were given embody, without a single instance of hesitation, not only the thematic properties of Halloween, but the spirit behind it. And it is with great ease that it meets all five of our criteria, or anyone else's that I was able to find, to be admitted into the holiday's celebratory cinematic canon. Its juxtaposition between the brilliant light and warmth of Prydain's forests, with their glowing landscapes of lush greens, argent yellows, and glistening oranges, accompanied by their scintillating soundscapes and gentle flutes against the suppressive darkness and the biting cold of the Horn King's Keep and Morva, with their lurid purples, their fathomless blues, and their Stygian blacks, as well as their toxic greens and their tormenting reds, underlined by an unweary and at times screeching assortment of thundering horns crashing symbols and wailing strings perfectly reflect and embody the transition from autumn to winter in the endless conflict that these two seasons have always been entrenched within. The Black Cauldron's characters, in all of their childish stumbling, foolish bravery, and emotional regression, exist as gleaming reflections of the warmth and liveliness and youth that the Gales so long ago knew to be the only true defense against the cold and decay of antiquity. And they're complemented all the more by the film's own production struggles, not just in that the cut development of their personalities actually accentuates their childlike audaciousness and lack of emotional refinement, but in that the Black Cauldron itself's conception and unyielding struggle against both Disney's newly appointed leadership and timeless identity directly mirrors Taryn Alanwi Fluter and Gurgi's youthful defiance to the decay and ruination of the antiquated forces that had pushed their world to the precipice of its doom. For a kingdom that was once the crowned jewel of the world of animation, an institution synonymous with not only joy but innovation, the Black Cauldron was a resounding charge against the decades of stagnation and cold and decay that had begun to suffocate the happiest kingdom on earth and drive its people from its lands. Most people like to say that the Black Cauldron was the film that almost killed Disney and I used to be one of them. But now I know that I was wrong. In fact, I think it is precisely this heavy and dark and sinister and rebellious and soft and loudish and boisterous and dream-filled production that saved Disney from its own winter and ushered in a dawn brighter than anything that Walt and Roy or the Nine Old Men or Bluth or even the critics that so fiercely besieged it could have ever imagined. The Black Cauldron was the genesis of a renaissance, and although its chances of finding any box office success were crippled by the management above it, and even though it was kept from home video until 13 years after its release following Katzenberg's departure from the company, I think that The Black Cauldron unmitigatedly succeeded in what it set out to do. Taryn and the film's supporting characters refused to conform to the formulaic, romance-obsessed films of Disney's past and the tired, coming-of-age abandonment of their fantasies that coming-of-age films were so insistent upon, electing, rather, to brazenly embrace their dreams and wielding their childish adoration of magical artifacts and the images of courageous warriors and exhilarant princesses and celebrated entertainers as a divining rod managed not only to navigate through a perilous world of undying soldiers and grisly dragons and demonic kings, but they managed to become the very things they dreamt of or deluded themselves into thinking they would be as well. The Black Cauldron was its generation's Sleeping Beauty, because its creators believed that it would be 
It is a film that reminds us that our fantasies and our aspirations are things that do not have to be outgrown. We are not beholden to the structures or institutions of the past beyond whatever reverence we have for them, and nothing, whether it be the magical forces of an ancient artifact or decades of expectations bearing down upon us, can ever make us give up what we wish to become. And I can't think of a better holiday for it to represent than one that is celebrated by children and adults alike to, for one night, become who we see ourselves as when we glimpse into the scrying glass or gaze into a pool of oracular water. Nor can I think of a feature more reaffirming of the fact that our reflections are never really that far from what we dreamt of when we were young. Because when I was young, when I was young. 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 I wanted to be. I wanted to. I wanted to be. A herpetologist. An aeronautical engineer. This guy. Myself. I wanted to be a professional martial artist. I wanted to be a fashion designer. A detective. I wanted to be a woman. I wanted to be a filmmaker. A therapist. An archaeologist. I wanted to be a mecha pilot. I wanted to be a paleontologist. I wanted to be a rockstar. I wanted to be a movie director. When I was young, I wanted to be a storyteller. And now I kind of am one. Thanks to you. Happy Halloween. Thanks for watching. Big, big, big thank you to my patrons for making this video possible, uh, especially these guys. And a very special thank you to Aaron Reyes, Alexi Aro Olavi, Alexander Montgomery, Avid, Blake Demby, Bobert, Bran Muffin, Brian Phillips, Charles J. Boyle, Deniane, Dr. Chike, Elena Lagerman, Gavin Miller, Ho Shin, Ib Sher, Jacob New, Jan Cyberg, Jordan Carter, Joshua Fogelson, Killer Space, Long Hoon, Marwan Mohammed, Mason W, Shane Vino, Strafen Nathan, Sugar Spencorn, Travis. Chris Osborne, Tristan Marino, William Cole, Yakov Duez, and Zellers4. Let me know what you thought about what I thought down below, and make sure to subscribe. Love you, love you, love you. Have a good night.